and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna. On this bonus edition of the podcast, we'll be tackling what I believe to be our game's biggest problem. Racism in football has once again rid its ugly head. We've seen incidents right across the continent, but of late, there have been a number of cases right here in the UK. Some would say racism is back. I'd say in truth, it probably never really went away. I'll be joined on the show by a former professional footballer, a man best known for his days with Brentford, Wimbledon and Watford. This gentleman also represented his country at the 1998 World Cup in France and now works extremely hard in the battle to eradicate racism from our game. It's none other than Marcus Gale. Marcus, welcome to the Chronicles of Aguna. Firstly, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join me. And, and how are you? I'm very well, Harry. Thanks for inviting me on your podcast. Looking forward to it. No problem at all, mate. The pleasure is all mine. Uh, firstly, Marcus, do you want to let our listeners know what it is that you're up to these days? I'm, all, I'm sure people are interested to find out uh, about all the excellent work you're doing now. Yeah, well, the, the last three years, I work alongside uh, Troy Townsend at Kick It Out, and we deliver equality-inspired workshops to all the academy players, aged from probably under 10s all the way up to under 23s, uh, coaching staff, and also parents as well. So we add support for the parents um, who are vital in this industry because they they have elite kids. So. That's basically what I do. Um, takes up a lot of travelling, which I don't mind. But the, the benefits are, you know, the kids have got more awareness around the, the, the topics that surround them and how to deal with it, what to do, what not to do. So I'm very passionate um, in, in terms of helping as many young players out there as possible. Absolutely. And it's some great work that you do. And I'm sure there are lots of people out there benefiting from it, of course. Um, Marcus, there have been lots of recent incidents involving supporters, yeah. you know, from a variety of different clubs are you yeah. surprised by the volume of incidents that we've seen this season i'm talking about racial incidents because you know i probably was a little bit naive in thinking that maybe this had gone away and this wasn't as yeah. much of an issue anymore but the last few months have shown us that that's not the case is it it's definitely not the case i think there's a an increase in incidences over the last year or so um why that is, I'm not too sure. Um, but the political tension in the country at the moment is, is building up as well. So it's not a football problem. It's a society problem um, that spills over into football. Um, so that's what we've got to fight is, you know, at stadiums, in, in and around stadiums, at football matches, that we can be seen to be dealing with it in an appropriate way to keep people safe keep people coming back to the stadiums because you know they're they're appreciated as a fan and as a player as well so the game is for everybody to to attend and um we've got some battle on our hands to try and combat it but i think we are getting there with the likes of people like raheem sterling that speak out about it and, yeah. and other players as well i think that's a healthy thing is that players are now saying hold up we need to hold this conversation um because it's 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 had a a subtle sort of 30 years where, you know, we thought we saw the last of the likes of a banana skin or a banana being thrown on the pitch, but it happened this season. Yeah. Um, and I think we, we kind of hoped it wouldn't come again, but it has. It's reared its head or its skin. Um, and that's, you know, that's just highlighting the, the severity of where we're at in the game. Um, clubs can do a lot more. Um, that authorities have to do a lot more. But that's a, that's a big topic to deal with. But it's one I'm, I'm quite glad to talk about as well, is how can we fix it? Um, I believe there's some key things that need to be addressed so we can try and um, eradicate it. What do you think that the, the way forward is? Because, you know, you mentioned that the, some of the incidents, you mentioned Raheem Sterling, and it's great that someone as high profile as him um, has come out and is back to the campaign and you know he's yeah. been subjected to quite a bit of it uh, in a yeah. sort of non-direct way in my opinion I think he gets a hard time yeah. from the tabloids and I think it probably is yeah. down to that it's down to you know you know people associating that sort of culture with 
Mm -hmm. you know with racing it's not right um but yeah. for me what i've been really disappointed with this season is uh you know i'm an arsenal fan and i i go to all the arsenal home games yeah. and i've seen incidents at the emirates stadium and i thought that at our club this was a non-issue and i've whenever i sort of get into debates with people about this topic i'm always proud to say i'm an arsenal supporter because there hasn't been much, well, there hasn't been any of it in recent times, yeah. but there was an incident the other night from one of our supporters where he was racially mm -hmm. abusing Koulibaly of Napoli. And for me, that is completely unacceptable. And that kind of made me go, wow, this is not a problem at just Chelsea, for example. And yeah. not to pick on Chelsea, but they're a club who probably are, you know, they've got previous of it. And, and so yeah. when you hear it, it's still wrong, but you kind of expect it. Whereas yeah. with Arsenal, that, didn't happen and it did happen the other night but how do you go about it because you, you know you can find the people you can ban them what's the solution what what is a severe enough punishment to put people off behaving this way um it's a great question a tough one to answer but i'm going to try to answer as much as i can on that topic um it's got multi sort of solutions to it it's not just a magic pill that's going to fix this problem um, you've touched on media. Media is an information network. It gives people information, yeah? Um, it can also give the wrong perception of players. And it's got the power to do that. I, I once read in the Bible years ago, it, there's a passage that says, the pen is mightier than the sword. So when you think of when that was written 2,000 years ago, Absolutely, and plus, yeah. Um, why would they say the pen is mightier than a double-edged sword, which was like, you know, the most feared weapon? But they said, the way I interpret that is that um, what's written is more powerful, it's more dangerous than an actual sword. Um, so the media has a, a moral responsibility in what it puts out there is to... Um, sorry about that. Sorry. To, is to talk the truth. And, to, and to, to enlighten people with the truth instead of putting out a perception that is negative. And we've seen the examples of it. So um, that's one aspect. Commentary, which I do at Brentford, um, the commentary has to be respectful and, and speak the truth as well. When Raheem got um, abused, the commentator, an ex-Liverpool player, he, at the time of the incident, he said, oh, they're just wishing him a happy birthday which, in fact, as we know, it was racial abuse. Yeah. So he has the power to influence the millions of viewers around the world with his statement. They're wishing him a happy birthday. So <laughs> we know that wasn't the case. So that needs to be addressed as well. Ultimately, um, the powers that be, the people that sit on the disciplinary or uh, the panels, the boardrooms, the leaders of the industry, they need to have more um understanding more respect more diversity with the conversations they're having now if the if the boardroom is not diverse then you're not taking you're not taking into consideration the needs of a multicultural society absolutely um, and i think once that changes we'll start having different conversations in the boardrooms which will lead on to disciplinary panels being different um and then we can have, you know, the rightful sort of sanctions to these uh, sort of, well, not sort of, they're, they're hate crimes. They're, they're giving the wrong impressions on people and they're poisoning the mass meat, uh, the mass population with this impression that is wrong. Yeah, absolutely. So, and I think, you know, there is a bit of a danger of people being scared to talk about it as well. I, I think that that has been a problem in recent years where, yeah. we, where we thought that it had gone away. It probably didn't go away. It was more a case of people were were afraid to bring it up. And like you said, it's great that certain players are coming out and talking about it now. Yeah. And, you know, in regards to like a commentator, for example, and I'm not in, yeah. in any way defending the guy's actions, but I think as a commentator in that situation, you're probably a little bit scared to bring that up because it's, you know, it's such a, a sensitive subject and that's not right. It needs to be... Yeah. Brought to the forefront of people's minds, in yeah. my opinion, and, and people need to be open and it's honest true. about it. Everyone's frightened of offending um, and not tackling it and calling it as it is. It's like 
saying racism today is like a taboo word. You don't want to be targeted with it. You don't want to be known as it. You don't want any suggestion about it. But the behaviours out there um, is racist at times. Um, sometimes it's at football matches. Um, and we have to call it as it is and deal with it accordingly. So they're trying to brush it under the carpet because this generation might not trip up on it, but the future generations, they'll trip up on, under what we've swept under that carpet. So yeah. we need to clean clean the house here, um, especially here, before we can start putting fingers internationally at uh, nations like Montenegro, with their sort of issue they had last month. But we've got a huge problem here to sort, sort out. So let's deal with what's here first, and then we can hopefully be the the front runners in tackling racism and discrimination across Europe and the rest of the world. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're spot on in, in saying that, that we need to get our house in order here because, you know, when it happened in Montenegro, everybody was very quick to condemn them. Um, you know, there's yeah. been some incidents in Italy, in Serie A, which is another yeah. league that I cover. And there's been lots of discussion about how the Italian authorities are just kind of like, eh, it happens sort of that. That's their attitude towards it. Yeah. And that's completely wrong as well. But then it's happening here as well. So who are we to sit there and say, you know, these yeah. guys aren't dealing with it. We need to deal with our own problems. Um, yeah. And it's kind of a bit of an arrogance, isn't it? In sort of the institutions yeah. that, as if to say, well, we don't have a problem with this, so we don't need to talk about it. Well, yeah. we clearly do because we've seen so many incidents uh, in the game. Yeah. It, it recently you know and you know it is really hard isn't it to come up with a punishment that will deter people from doing it i think you were spot on earlier on when you said it's a, a society problem that's spilled into the game uh, i don't think there's any question about that and i'm not saying that you know if you're a brexiter you're a racist or the other way yeah. around or, but that ha that whole debate that whole political debate has sparked lots of uneasy feelings and has given yeah. people the opportunity certain politicians in the media to be able to yeah. say whatever they like and, and that's a key point right you're it. saying it's when you you get the leaders of of a political party or someone in a position of power it could be a president for instance or a prime minister people hang on to those words because they're the, like the number one person in their role and they've got the power to, to say what they like, and that influences. So I do a lot of like research and historical stuff, not just in football, but just history in general. Yeah. Um, and the perception, I'm, and I'm uncovering some some bitter truths, so to speak. And you're getting endorsements from ex presidents and and people of influence over the the many decades and centuries that perpetuates a, a perception of people of colour as inferior. And people believe that. And that's that's you know, that's a crime in itself, is that people actually believe it. They're they're blindly fed and they don't trust who's they they don't not trust who's feeding them that information. They, they don't scrutinise the information. And I'm an individual that I scrutinise everything. At the moment we can't trust the government to sort out Brexit. Exactly. And at the moment, we can't trust FIFA or UEFA to sort out racism because in FIFA's world, they said that their task force has done its job. That it's complete. Oh, hello. We've still got problems in Europe. We've still exactly. got problems in Britain. So this ain't going to be like it's going to be over on, on our watch. This is going to be continuing as a fight to eradicate it and hopefully we'll make it better during our lifetime. But we've got to cut to the chase and get to the, the influential people that run the game, sit them down. Let's talk through transparency and honesty about how people are viewed in this world. Who sits on these panels? Um, what's their background? Is there any empathy? Because it seems that like the world at the moment is sick. Yeah. So everybody's sort of, in a way, spiritually sick. Um, and it's just getting wild. There's so much crime going on and reporting and and all of that and it's spilling out into sports especially football as we know um, we don't want to see that we want to see some kind of understanding people showing a bit of empathy but we need people more like how Southgate dealt with it we need more managers like him to say you know what I'm not going to duck the question I'm going to take it yeah. full on and I'm disappointed with what's happened I'm there for my players and Southgate is he's the shining light in all of this is that if we can have more managers like him, this game will be a better place um, instead of having managers that don't want to tackle it. I think the 
the managers are all uneasy at the moment because now they know there's a pressure from the players or I will walk off yeah. or this will happen or that will happen. Managers are nervous. They don't want it on their time sheet that something's happened like that because do they know how to handle it? Um, I would say a higher percentage probably don't know how to handle it and probably some just don't want to deal with it. Absolutely. So they need to educate the, the, the staff in terms of what to do, what's the process is. But we need people to be brave and think, you know what, it's beyond the game. This is a humanitarian issue now as well because people's lives are affected by it so so greatly. What do you make of the whole idea of, of players walking off when they hear it? Do you think that's the right approach? Um, yes and no. I know Sterling said he would stay on and score a goal. I'm like, it's easy for Raheem Sterling to say that because he plays <laughs> he's good. They, they score a million goals a season, so the likelihood is that he's going to be correct. <laughs> but what happens if you're you play at the bottom of the Premier League, or you play at League One and League Two? How do you handle it? So I don't look at the top players. I look at the players that are at League One and League Two most of their lives. How do they handle the same situation? Is it easier for Raheem to walk off or, or to stay on? Probably yes. Is it harder for League One and League Two players to walk off and take that stance? Probably difficult for them to do. They need their wage more than anybody. And that's not to disrespect them. You know, I've played League One football in my time and I remember the wages I got. I used to walk <laughs> home from matches. So I needed I needed to play well. I had to withstand certain um, vocabulary around the place at times so I don't have to lose my dream of playing football so I look at the League 2 players and think would they walk off I think yes they would they're in a position now with with social media is that you don't need the national press to to make your point That's you don't right. need the, 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 new, the, the news crews to come and make your point we've all got the power lying within our hands which is the smartphone and you've got your social media you put it out there so I wouldn't say to take it into their own hands, but to follow the procedures first. Do that. Put the pressure on the authorities to change. The fans will start seeing that if there's no change, then they know that they've got to start making noises and people can vote with their feet. But the players need to, to understand the process of what they're doing. Um, is it going to affect them personally? Some will say they don't care. They're happy to pay the fine. I'm happy with that. But... <laughs> We need to be focusing the, the attention on the perpetrators and Absolutely. not the person that's been the victim. That's right. And, you know, talking about them following procedures and stuff, I think they'd be a lot more willing to follow procedures if they could see that the authorities were actually yeah. trying to do something about yeah. it. You know, it's all yeah. good being the FA and saying you need to follow process one, two and three, but we're not yeah. actually doing anything about it to give you any confidence in yeah. that procedure so there's, there's that kind of angle at it as well um marcus have you ever experienced any sort of racial abuse on a football pitch or around the football club personally um no not on the football pitch nothing one-to-one um i had an incident when i was fairly young in my early days um and that was just with the crowd i noticed there was making some sounds with me and another black player was warming up and that was all so i kind of sense what they were saying but you can't just in detail, pick out what they're saying. They're making noise because they're seeing two young black boys warming up up north. <laughs> <laughs> um, that made me think, oh, well, shame on you. I'm going to make your booze turn into respect and cheering me. You're going to remember me by how good I am anyway. That's my mentality with it. So I kind of programmed and institutionalized myself with that mentality to get through instead of absorbing all the negative stuff was probably said but I blocked all that out I didn't want nothing to do with all that I'm like I I want to play football I love football nothing and no one is going to stop me playing football so to a point I just blocked it socially <laughs> in the last three years I've had my first incident of being racially abused uh, which turned out um, I didn't get arrested or anything there was no police involved but I was thinking if I got out of the car and the police came the perception as we're talking about who would they deem as the bad guy in this? Someone yeah. that's six foot two, sixteen stone, eyebrows that look frowny anyway. They're going <laughs> to automatically say, well, he's the perpetrator. I, mean, I didn't want to take that chance. So it's a good thing the car door can open up because we we're so close. And I went about my day. But as the day went on, I started 
uh, recollecting what was happening, I started getting angrier. <laughs> then I had to try and go to sleep and wake up in a more peaceful mode. But I'm thankful that I did go through that process of thought. I had to think differently. And why should I have to think differently? Why can't I just be angry? I've got to think carefully as a six foot two black man in Britain when I get abused. I've got to really think about my actions and the consequences because some of it is I might not have been able to go home that night. And these were the thoughts that was going in my head. You know, I've got a missus, I've got kids. And I'm thinking I'm, I'm somebody to people and I need to go home. So I need to keep myself calm while this lunatic was just verbally abusing me. <laughs> but people don't understand that's what we've got to go through. I was angry later on. At the time, I was cool as anything because I knew I had to be. Yeah. Because there, there was there would have been a chance of it might not have gone so well if I had reacted. And why can't I react? Yeah, it's, it's not. You're right. It's absolutely, uh, you know, a disgrace that you know we're in 2019. You know, people like yourself are still having to deal with these kind of things. But you know, the thing that frustrates me as well is you know people need this is a a wider problem isn't it than just you know mm-hmm. Mohammed Salah's been getting it the last few days yeah. as well like this is a widespread problem across all different cultures um you know I'm from a Greek background and I know that my family experienced it when they mm. first come to the UK um yeah. back in the 70s and I'm I'm not making I'm not sounding like it's just in the UK because this happens in other countries as well yeah but obviously this is the example we have because this is where we live this is where we were raised so it's always going to be the example I use, but it's a, yeah. a, a much wider problem, um, in my opinion. And the, the last point I, I want to sort of touch on is, you know, we're always talking about black managers and that there's not enough of them. Yeah. And it's disproportionate to the number of black players that there are in our game. And I think that is a really, really big problem, a really yeah. unfair issue. And uh, the, the example I'll use being an Arsenal fan is Sol Campbell. Yeah. Um, you know, Sol Campbell played at the very highest level, um, you know, he wanted to get into management. He's openly spoken about this as well. The fact that he went for lots and lots of interviews, didn't get the jobs. And he's had to start right at the bottom uh, of the yeah. sort of the ladder to get into the game. Whereas somebody like Frank Lampard or Steven Gerrard, and I'm not saying that they're bad managers or anything like that. Or Joey Barton, or, or, for that matter. Exactly. Or Joey Barton or, you know, Paul Scholes went into Oldham. It didn't work out. But... These guys, you know, they played at the top level too and they were given jobs just like that. And I'm not saying that they're not good managers. It's not personal to them. But these are just examples Mm. of players that Sol Campbell played at the same level as and probably commands the same respect as. And he he doesn't get the the roles, you know. And is there anything that you know of that's being done about that? Is there any talks about that? Because it seems to me like the FA... There there is talks. There is talks about it. at a conference yesterday with Kick It Out called Rage Again, which was at yep. the Emirates. Um, and it's it's the boardroom. It's not it's not the lack of quality with coaches and managers. It's the problem is the boardroom. The boardroom all look from the same demographic. Yeah. So um if they they'll employ someone that looks similar to them. So my question to you is when's the last time have you seen a black man in a boardroom? Yeah. Uh, When's the last time we've seen a black man in a director's box at a Premier League stadium? No, that's absolutely right. It's a great point. So once that is set that way, it's going to make it very hard for a black manager to to get the the breaks, the opportunities. Um, and it is it is tough. I've, I've I've grown up here knowing I've had to be three or four times better than my white counterparts. That's just been standard from as little as I was kicking a ball. Um, I knew that. No one had to tell me that, but I could just visibly see that. There's different conversations you're not spoken about in the same light um, as your your white counterparts. Um, And that mentality is still rife today. That's because of a groupthink mentality. Boardrooms, they all look the same. They've got the same demographic of person on there. They might have the odd person of difference, to say that they're, you know, we've got diversity. I don't, what, I don't, I don't buy that at all. Until you see black people in in the boardroom, you can't see there's change. There might be talk of it, but until you see that, um, there's there's going to be issues because the talent is out there. Um, personally, if I saw Campbell, I it's just me personally. 
I wouldn't, I wouldn't manage if I was him personally. If I was him, I would go buy a club and build that club. If it is National League or whatever, go and buy a club at that level. He's, he's got the funds to go and do that. Um, buy a club, raise the club, own a club. But why don't you collaborate with other top players of, of that generation? Buy a club, do a Salford in the mm. class of 92. They're doing that. They're doing that from the grassroots level. And they're going to build that club into a league club one day. And that's what you know the black community or the BAME community need to look at doing in terms of ownership, having the, the key people in the right positions, uh, but not to replicate what we're fighting, but to, to put a, a balanced board, board um, together with the right components in it to show you to show the world how how it should be run how it should include everybody and not just one type of person in, in the boardroom. So the that's, battle's that's strong a great point. That's and, a great point. And I feel for him because if he doesn't do well at Macclesfield, where's he going to get, where's the next opportunity going to come from for him? If he's, you know, 20, what is it, 22nd, 23rd in, in League Two, um, where do you come back from that? It's a hard place to come back. But the talent is there. Darren Moore, he's ready to go again told me that with his own words yesterday, he's ready to go again. He's grateful for the experience. You know he done well well enough personally. He's ready to sink his teeth back into football and I hope he does get a a, a very good job in terms of ambition, patience, because everybody needs that. You need the opportunity. How can you still have Joey Barton getting the how how was he in a position to get the job in the first place after his crime sheet? Yeah, exactly. Before him, he was banned for 18 months for, for gambling. Can't play for Burn. Got to leave football. But yet he can still get, he still thought of better than a Sol Campbell or an Andy Cole. And he's been in the papers again, hasn't he, for a, a assault in someone? Yeah, the other assault, day? assault on, at the weekend. So is he going to face charges for this and then do, do a little bit of whatever time and then come back out and still be at the top of the queue? I'm like, if that's the case, then we know the game's fixed. Yeah. We know the game's fixed. And that's what will um, put people off, that um, coaches and managers, that will put them off. It's like, why throw and waste your time into um, something that it's already been fixed against you? You're not going to get in. And I know people like that in, within the game. Is that like, why waste time? Yeah, I'm one of those. I'm like, yep, yeah, I could go back into coaching, but... Well, I don't want to go back into the coaching um, and be at the bottom of the queue waiting to prove myself. You know what I mean, where I can get into education, which I've done for the last three years, yeah. and make an immediate impact now with players. I've got something to, to deliver. I've got the knowledge to, to, to share. Let me get that out there and help as many people from every different background as possible instead of dreaming about, oh, the ego wants me to be a coach, be a manager. That's just me personally. You know what I mean? That's the ego part of me. But the essence part of me is educate, help enlighten people, help teach people, make people's lives better with a little bit of knowledge that they can carry for the rest of their life or yeah. whatever it is and hopefully make a big difference in this world. Great stuff. Marcus, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and uh, on a, what is a very, very important issue and I'm glad that we we were able to speak and i'm sure our listeners are going to love this conversation and love the insight so. that you've provided uh, marcus yeah. do you want to let our listeners know how they can find you on social media and keep up with the great work that you're doing you're, you're testing my age now because i get asked this a couple <laughs> of times and i'm like i don't even know my handle but I'll, i will give it a try uh, so on twitter i am um, marcus 11 gale lovely um, you can find me on that on instagram i'm just gale force 11 because you don't want to mess with this breeze when it gets up into steam, you know. <laughs> so, Gale Force Eleven. Um, I do a lot of interaction on on Instagram. Um, I post things to make people think. I don't post to antagonise, but just to stir your thinking. Um, and as I said, I want to help enlighten people with knowledge, share knowledge, receive knowledge as well. I'm open to that as well. So, um, that's that's what I'm about. I want to help as many people as possible and, and grow as an individual myself brilliant great stuff marcus thank you so much and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening and you my friend you take care hope it all goes well